Chuck. Yeah. Got another explainer for you. And okay. you brought Gary this time. Yeah, well, of oh, course. That, that means we've got to put some, got to put some sports spin on this one. All right. Spin has <laughs> a lot to do with sports. So I, I, you guys called me into this, Gary. What, yes. what, what do you want me to do? <laughs> what, what are some things you thought you knew, but maybe you didn't, and so here I am. What do you have for Your me? assignment, Dr. Tyson, yes, if you choose to, to accept, accept it. That's what that is. <laughs> and this tape will, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. So there are some very, very big scientific names attached to things. And then all of a sudden you find they appear, their theories, their principles appear in places. Well, you know what? I never knew that was the case. Mm -hmm. Now, if we took the, the great and the good Coriolis and then said to you, Field goal kick. I think you would have a thought. I indeed would and do. So, but let's. We should talk about the Coriolis force. Yes. First of all, okay. It's not really a force. In fact, we officially call it a fictitious force. It feels like you're a force if you're in the middle of experiencing it, but it's okay. not actually a force. Pure and okay. Simple. Okay. Mm. Okay. All right. So it's what happens if you try to move in a straight line on something that's rotating. Aha. Uh -huh. Then your path on that rotating object is not a straight line, even though you swear you're moving in a straight line. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. So, so take for example a spinning platter. We used to call those record players. Okay. <laughs> oh, nice. You could so spin it. You know, put it at thirty-three and a third RPM, and take sort of a chalk, and start at the edge and make a straight line to the spindle. You mm -hmm. If you do that and then stop the thing and look at what your chalk line did, it will be this curve from the edge of the platter to the center. Right. So if you are on that platter, you would say there's some force pushing this chalk in a direction that's to the side. Hmm. This, okay. this is how you would interpret what you saw. And so you would invoke, you'd say there must be a force. Right. And in this case, we would call that the Coriolis force. Meanwhile, there's no such force act, acting on the system. So that's that's what's going on there. So so this would happen to anybody trying to do a straight line or any kind of path on something that's in motion. If you try to do it on a on a a, a, a merry-go-round, okay, uh, you could try to walk in a straight line, but it's not going to work, right? Relative to the merry-go-round. So that's all it is. Y'all y'all also look like a drunk person. Mm, yes, yes. It, I've tried it. I've tried you've it. Tried it. You've yeah. tried it. You yeah. tried it. <laughs> but wait, Chuck, it was stationary when you did it. <laughs> ah! <laughs> all right. So, the perhaps the most common invocation of the Coriolis force is that which forces winds on earth to curve into storms. Uh-huh. Oh. Okay. So there's there's an air, air you know, air moves, yeah. okay, on Earth's surface. Mm -hmm. But Earth's surface is rotating with the solid Earth. So here I am, and I see a, a low-pressure system, and I'm a nice puffy cloud, okay? Yeah. And if I see a low-pressure system, I'm going to go towards the low-pressure system because there's, that must mean there's a higher pressure behind me and I get pushed into the low pressure system, okay? And I'm gonna make a beeline for it, or a cloud line for it, okay? So there I am, but wait. If I'm going north to meet my low pressure system, and I'm a cloud south of it, let's, we're in the northern hemisphere now. Wait a minute, as I go north, I find myself overtaking the low pressure system. Because my sideways motion is faster where I started from than where the low pressure is. And we've done this before. The equator is moving 1,000 miles an hour sideways. And if you're up at, 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 at in, uh, northern Florida or D.C. or in, in New York, you're moving slower from west to east than the equator is. Yeah, you're all part of the same solid object, yes, but... 
you complete one circle in the same amount of time as folks at the equator do, and they travel the longer distance to do it. So therefore, you must be traveling more slowly. They must be traveling faster than you. Here's the point. I'm a cloud berthed near the equator. I'm going sideways a thousand miles an hour. Now I start marching north. I'm not touching the earth. I'm floating in the atmosphere. And I see the, the low pressure system and I find myself overtaking it. And I end up veering to the right. Mm -hmm. And by the same token, a puff of cloud north of that low pressure system, it, all, it too wants to reach the low pressure system, except it's traveling slower than the low pressure system. So it, travel, it goes south and it, and, it, and, and it lags behind. So all the air migrating north goes, ends up ahead of the storm and all the air going south ends up behind the storm. You put all this together, you get a counterclockwise circulation around the low pressure system, otherwise known as a storm because the cloud carries moisture. And if you're a, a, a cloud magnet, all right, and right, so low yeah. pressure systems are, are nucleate storms for this reason. There so it is. So what speed do I need to do, Neil, to overcome a Coriolis force? You have 45. to stop. Instead of 33 and a third. <laughs> oh, well played, I got you. I got you. Yeah, oh, the 78? Go you don't want the 78? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you all have some old farts there on the other side of the storm. Yeah. So the point is, the storms have so much weather going on in them because yeah. all the weather is trying to get to the low pressure system. And the low pressure system is the center of the storm. That's why there's rain at a hurricane. Okay, oh, and by the way, do you know about the eye of the hurricane? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> maybe. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say something and have you tear me to pieces, am I? <laughs> so, that, Chuck, that sounds like a no, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> do you know what's happening? Well, I think I do. No. So, so the, the eye of the hurricane is completely clear. Yeah. Right. No rain and it's yeah. perfectly quiet. Okay. And I saw a movie called Marooned. It was a 1960s pre-moon landing movie, but we knew we were headed there. So we, start, we the, you know, Hollywood started making movies about this. So there are astronauts who were marooned in space. I don't remember why. And we got to save them. All right. So there's another launch vehicle that this is in Florida. Florida, like, likes hurricanes, don't they? Okay. Yeah. So they're, 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 they're ready to launch the rescue vessel because they're running out of oxygen, but they can't launch it because a hurricane is coming. Because then they'll put the other astronauts at risk. So everyone's giving up hope on this rescue mission until someone points out, wait a minute, the path of this hurricane goes right over Cape Canaveral. Oh, so we how can, about that? We can, how about that? So we can launch right over Cape what? Canaveral when the, all the weather dies down. So I was like nine years old or something. And I said, that's kind of cool. And so from then on, I was highly intrigued by hurricanes that this yeah. can happen. So, here's the problem. Uh, the hurricane would have ripped apart the rocket before it got, to, you got to get it from the outside of the hurricane to the eye of the hurricane. Oh, no, 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 no. So, so it's, it's the, 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 the spaceship is attached to the gantry. It's fine. It's oh, okay. fine. And it's round. So it's not, it's not like a, it's not like a, a balloon. It's so not, it's like, not a, like a, it's not like mm. a building where it's going to be ripped apart. Yeah. No, it, it'll, it'll. It's aerodynamic. It's, it, it'll, it's, it's, it's fine. Okay. It's, okay. It's mm -hmm. fine for that, for that purpose. All right. We should all build houses. Shaped like with rockets gantries, on gantries. <laughs> yeah. And we'll all okay. be hurricane proof. <laughs> I'm not I'm not gonna volunteer to test that theory. <laughs> There's probably some wind speed that would knock over a rocket. Uh oh, by the way, the rocket that they worried would get knocked over in the movie The Martian. Right. right? That's why they left Mark Watney on the ground. Right. They, so he's probably dead. We better take off now before this dust storm on Mars right, the knocks us that over. That storm's going to kill us, right? Kill us, so, okay, so let's leave yeah. him, give him up for dead. And, of course, he was alive. But, but the atmospheric pressure on Mars is one one-hundredth that of the atmospheric pressure on Earth. One one-hundredth. Oh. So if you have a 100-mile-an-hour wind on Mars, there ain't much air there doing it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, like an infant going. Yeah, it's a. Yeah, that's it. Like, oh. So they could have so okay. easily waited and then saved Martin's ass, but they didn't. They just left that boy 
have to die. Anyhow, mm -hmm. so so here's and the he point. He was a scientist, so you know what he said. Uh, what would he say? Y'all just left me, cause you know I you you don't think I know what the atmosphere pressure is on here on <laughs> Mars. <laughs> Oh, you're you not left getting me that on purpose. I'm not going for it. I'm not you, going. Y'all left me, and you know it. <laughs> Go try to no. The right. atmospheric pressure wouldn't have toppled you over. You know right. that. Yeah, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> all right. So here's the thing: because all of this air has sideways motion to the center of the low pressure system, it never actually reaches the center. That's why it's clear in the center. It's a fascinating right. fact. Okay, that that's why it never actually gets there. All right. So that's how you get hurricanes. If you repeat yes. that scenario for the southern hemisphere, then what you find is that the forces operate such that the storm rotates in the opposite direction. So storms in the southern hemisphere rotate clockwise. Storms in the northern hemisphere rotate counterclockwise. When I say storms, I mean low-pressure storms. By the way, air circulates the opposite way for high-pressure centers. But if, because the air wants to leave... It will still circulate, but since high pressure systems repel clouds, no one thinks of them as a storm. But it's essentially a high pressure storm. Have you ever been completely cloudless days and it was very windy? Yeah. That's what you're yeah. experiencing. Okay, you're, you're experiencing air escaping away from the high pressure system, gaining speed relative to you on the rotating Earth. So, yes, you can have high winds with no clouds because the clouds are not collecting. If they're not collecting, you don't have rain or storms or, or, or hail Actually, or anything. They, they do call them wind storms when, they're, when the winds are high enough. You can have them, right, and they'll knock stuff over, because, but not right. because it carries precipitation. That's right. all. Turns out, mm -hmm. I'm watching a football game. I'm watching a I, It was like a quarter to six on a Sunday, and I finished watching some show. I forgot. No, it was a, a, another football game, and I have a show coming on at six, and I'm and I'm channel surfing, and I came upon the Cincinnati Bengals playing somebody. Was it who are the Seattle folk? The uh, the Seahawks. Seahawks. I think it was the Seahawks, but it was definitely mm -hmm. Cincinnati Bengals. Okay, and right at that time, I tuned in. It was a tie, and the game ended. So they went into a full period overtime. Okay, now you know the rules. I think they've even changed since I last memorized them. But each team gets possession, all right? And if they score a field goal, the other team gets a chance to score a field goal. If nobody scores with each possession, then it's sudden death, okay? That's the state of this game at the time in the 15 minutes that I watched. So it's sudden death overtime at this point. Cincinnati has the ball. They're at the 50. 50 yard, 45 yard line plus 10 yards, mm -hmm. or whatever it, it, whatever is the hike with the kick, they had to make a 55 yard field goal. And if they make it, it's for the win. If they don't, the game continues, but they could win it on this kick. So I'm watching this, and the kick, it goes up and it tumbles. This is where no one breathes, okay, <laughs> in the stadium. Nobody breathes. And you see the ball tumble, and it's tumbling. And there it goes. And it hits the left upright and careens in for the score. And the Cincinnati Bengals win. And I said, wait a minute. Hold on. And I did a fast calculation. So it was airborne for like three and a half seconds, something like that. I did the math. I checked the orientation of the stadium. The stadium is oriented north-south. And I, I said, oh, my gosh. The Cincinnati Bengals for the win field goal kick was aided by a third of an inch deflection to the right yeah. caused by the rotation of the earth. People lost their minds. I tweeted it. People lost their mind. People wrote in and say, God help Cincinnati yeah. win. I know that rotation. kicker loved you. The uh, kicker yeah. was just like, <laughs> the earth hates me. Well, because you the know from baseball, if you take a, a round object – and hit it with another round object, all right, a fraction of an inch can make all the difference in how the thing bounces away from it. Absolutely. Right? So you have a round bat hitting a round ball, a cylindrical bat, but it's still round in its cross right. section, hits a round ball, a fraction of an inch is a ground out, home run, or a pop out. Okay? Same is true with a round football hitting the cylindrical upright. 
So, I think that third of an inch made a difference, and you can ca that's how much Coriolis force operated in the 55 yards of the field goal. Well, the Coriolis owes a lot of people some money. Because <laughs> you know everybody who had money riding on that game. No, you checking the bets. Yeah, they were just like, how do we find this Coriolis? Now, now just because I'm an educator, I, 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 I said the rotation of the earth, but I didn't mention Coriolis. Because if you label it, then people get distracted by the name and it prevents them from understanding the concept. So okay. I said from the rotation of the earth. Well, how does that happen? The next two tweets, I said, this is like the Coriolis force, and then I mentioned storms and this sort of thing. So now for all north-south oriented stadiums, I, I watch for this uh, when that happens. So there you have it, Coriolis force on storms and football games and it putting chalk on old-fashioned record players playing at any speed at all, Chuck. All right, guys, we got to call it quits on the Coriolis effect. I didn't mention who the dude was who first came up with it. Uh -huh. okay, let me check my notes right. here and get his whole name right. Gaspard Gustav Coriolis. Oh, yeah. He He's totally a... fictitious. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nobody would have that name in real life. <laughs> <laughs> well, only his force is a fictitious uh, force. That's uh, oh. Not him. All right. Uh, he published a paper in 1835 with this analysis. So this is still relatively modern, the last couple of hundred years. Yeah. Get the understanding of this, given right. how long we've been thinking about the natural world. Uh -uh. So anyhow, uh, that's it for this installment of Explainers. Neil deGrasse Tyson here. Keep looking up. <laughs>